Good afternoon and welcome to the latest Oxford Sparks Facebook Live. Today we are live in the Rewinkle Lab in the MRC Human Immunology Unit at the MRC Weatherhall Institute of Molecular Medicine here in Oxford. Two researchers from the lab have taken their time out today to kind of show us around the lab and answer a few questions about their work. So I'm really excited to be here today. Can I firstly ask you to introduce yourselves? Yes, so hi, I'm Lyal. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the lab, which means that I'm training to be a scientist while also working towards my degree, my PhD. And it also means I get to learn from more experienced scientists like my colleague Miriam. And my name is Miriam. I am a postdoctoral researcher here at the Institute. That means I've done my PhD and I have the opportunity here to gain more experience, um, learn more skills and hopefully be able to run my own research group soon. And I'm really excited to be actually in a lab today. So, you know, firstly, tell our audience kind of what kind of research you do in the lab. So uh, our research focuses on understanding how uh, the body knows when it's been invaded by a virus. Okay. Uh, and we're really lucky to have funding from a number of different sources. So, uh, for example, the Wellcome Trust and the MRC. Uh, in fact, as you said, we're in the MRC Human Immunology Unit. Uh, and so that means we have access to tools, resources and expertise in immunology. So immunology is basically the study of the immune system, uh, and that's our body's defense system against unwanted invaders like viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi. Uh, and in our lab, we're particularly interested in understanding how we defend ourselves against viruses. Um, so a big question we're working on is uh, to understand how a cell knows when it's become infected by a virus. But what is a virus, though? <laughs> a virus is actually a very interesting and fascinating thing. So. Um, if you have a look at this, um, let's assume this is one of your white blood cells, and actually this is a model of a white blood cell, which is one million times bigger than your actual yeah. white blood cell, um, then a virus would actually be that Ooh, big. Let me have a look. Yes. So oh, wow. really, 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 really tiny. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and the main thing to know about a virus is that it's actually not a living thing. Um, it's a non-living parasite. Okay. So what that means is that, for example, if you put that virus into a dish filled with nutrients, this virus would stay there and do nothing. Whereas if you have a bacterium, put that in a dish with nutrients again, and then this bacterium would divide and divide and divide, and you will have a whole bunch of viruses in that dish until, well, they're running out of nutrients. And so what the virus needs is actually you to reproduce it. Oh. So it will hijack your cell, and your cell will then reproduce more viral particles. So the main part of a virus is its genome, which means that this is the instruction on how to build more viral particles. And the genome itself is packaged with um, fats and proteins so that it's safe. And um, then on the surface, you have proteins that would attach to your cell so that the virus is actually getting into your cell to reproduce. Um, what is different between the different sorts of viruses is shapes and uh, size, but also the tools they have. So each virus has a um, set of tools that it can use to hijack the cell. And the fascinating thing is that a lot of viruses have less than 10 tools to do so. And I think that's quite cool to see how they manage. But how do our cells detect like an invading virus? So this is exactly what we're kind of trying to understand right. in the lab. Okay. Uh, so one thing that Miriam explained really nicely is that viruses are basically packets of genes. Uh, and genes can be made of uh, DNA, for example. You guys are probably all quite familiar with that, yeah. that structure. So DNA or uh, its sister molecule, RNA. Um, and basically, the, in our cells, we have sensors which can specifically find and recognize this DNA and then activate an alarm in the cell. So if we imagine that right now we're inside a cell and it's just been, unfortunately, invaded by a virus, then the first thing that the cell can see is these genes coming right. from the virus, that DNA. It can sense that and then uh, activate this alarm which will warn the cell, we've been infected, we need to do something about it. And also hopefully warn surrounding cells that there's a virus here. And how, like, how do our cells respond to an invading virus then? So as Lyal just uh, mentioned, uh, there's a warning signal. This is called interferon. It's a protein that's produced by the infected cell. And then it's, sec it's secreted into its environment. So all the other cells are warned. And each of these cells, by detecting this warning signal, produces a, a whole lot of proteins that can inhibit or attack the virus. Mm -hmm. um, there are more than 300 produced. They're called interferon-stimulated genes. Mm -hmm. And um, so they have a variety of tools against uh, the virus, again. Okay. 
Yeah, so another way that our cells can react when they realize they've been invaded by a virus is actually by committing suicide. Uh, so oh, wow. this okay. probably sounds like a bad thing, but actually it's, it's very good because if you imagine that we've got millions of cells in our body and just one or two have become infected by a virus, yeah. then when those cells eliminate themselves and eliminate the virus with them, they prevent that from spreading to other cells in the body and then making us sick in the process. Uh, and that's actually something that I'm really interested in as part of my PhD research. Okay. So um, in the lab, we can study this uh, by growing cells in uh, a dish. For example, I have a flask here of cells. This pink liquid is uh, basically medium of food for the cells, so right. nutrients that keep them alive. And usually I'd, I'd grow them at 37 degrees, so body temperature, to keep okay. them happy, comfortable. Um, but I've taken them out today just to show you what it looks like. Um, and I can actually uh, infect these cells with a virus in the, in the lab and then uh, watch the cells by microscopy over time and you can see that they'll start dying. Um, but because we can't see anything at this resolution, yes. um, I provided a cool video, okay. uh, which hopefully is playing right now. And uh, you can see that uh, over time, uh, when I add a red dye to the cells, which stains them as they're dying, the cells are slowly turning red, which tells me that they're dead. Right. And then that's something that I can see down the microscope and actually measure to see uh, that the cells are dying. And so that's a really exciting way that um, I can study that during my PhD. Um, and so hopefully those cells which have turned red and died are eliminated from the body, um, protecting the body from infection. But how do you research like viruses in a lab environment and, and is it safe? Um, well, so I've worked with a yeah. bunch of different viruses. I've worked with influenza viruses, herpes viruses, now I'm working with Zika. And each of these viruses is classified into a different biosafety level. Right. And with this biosafety level, um, there, there's a guideline applied so that we can handle the virus um, in a way that it's safe for us um, as researchers, but also safe for the environment in the lab and outside the lab. So um, the classification um, depends on a whole lot of factors. Right. For example, you have uh, a virus that can infect humans and cause disease. This will be a different biosafety level than just a virus that can infect chicken or mice. Right. Um, also, like the mode of infection differs between viruses. So you have flu viruses yeah. that spread when you sneeze or, or cough. Um, that needs to be taken into account when you apply biosafety levels. So for example, Zika virus mostly is transferred by mosquito bite. That's, okay. that's, that's a different mode. And um, so if you take Zika, Zika virus, for example, the biosafety level is officially two. That means we could handle it here in the lab. This lab is a biosafety level two lab. But to make sure that, um, most importantly, pregnant women in the building don't uh, get in contact with the virus, we decided to work with it in a biosafety level three environment. Right. And that's a different part of our lab. So how that works is um, this lab is um, closed by, by two door system. Right. Okay. Um, and within the lab, we have a lower air pressure. That means even if the two door system fails, um, the airflow would go into the lab and not out of the lab. Right. So whatever we have in that lab will stay in the lab. Sustained. And yeah. um, that's much safer, of course. Um, also, we have a different equipment um, to protect ourselves, and I can show this. Yeah, so, definitely. of course, sure. um, I would leave all my normal lab equipment here. So the I was going to say, I am goggles. dressed like we are in, is it category? Two. Two at the moment, yes. so hence why we're all in lab yes. coats <laughs> and wearing our glasses. So what yeah. would you wear, sorry, for category three? So. Um, the first thing is we have a double glove system, so I would wear a normal pair of gloves um, underneath. Okay. And um, then the second pair of gloves. Okay. Um, that way we can make sure that um, if I get in touch with the virus, I can change the um, outer gloves and uh, still don't expose my skin to, to the lab environment. Right. Of course, I'm also wearing goggles in okay. the Cat3 lab. And um, we have a different lab coat, um, like a surgical one you can see here. Okay, great. Um, if you are just tuning in, um, we are live from the MRC Human Immunology Unit um, at the MRC Weatherhall Institute of Molecular Medicine here in Oxford. Ask your questions. You know, we've got the opportunity to speak, speak to these two you know, great researchers here at, um, at Oxford. So ask your questions. I mean, we're discovering about what a virus is today. Um, so please comment below and we'll try and get those answered uh, later on. So okay. great. Yeah, there we go. Of course, additionally, you can also um, protect your face with a face right. shield or a mask if you work, for example, with viruses that spread through the air or, or liquids. Okay. It makes it easy. But what I want to know is, like, why does your research matter? Um, 
So our research matters on, on a whole variety of levels. So first of all, we learn how different viruses are, or where, where, they, where they have their weaknesses. So when we compare different viruses, then we see oh, this virus is more affected by this yeah. and the other one more by that. And that means at, at later stage, this could translate into new targets for drugs or vaccines. Um, and of course, also from the other perspective, we learn how our body deals with viruses. And um, that's super fascinating to learn how we can actually, yeah, overcome a viral infection. Okay. Yeah, I completely agree with what Miriam has said. So I, I think uh, another potentially interesting side of our research is that uh, if we understand how these sensors recognize DNA or mm -hmm. genes coming yeah. from an invading virus, we can also understand how these sensors work in other disease contexts. So, uh, for example, we know that sometimes this sensing system can go wrong and you can kind of get a false alarm in yeah. response to the cell's own DNA, so when there's no virus. And that might sound quite innocent, but it can actually be quite a bad thing because uh, that false alarm can actually cause damage to healthy cells if these immune responses are activated against uh, the wrong target. Uh, so that's uh, an example of that is uh, autoimmune diseases like mm -hmm. lupus. Right. Um, but also recently some research has revealed that uh, these sensors could be important in cancer. Mm -hmm. So when cancer cells die, it turns out that they can release their DNA into the surroundings and it can then be sensed by these very same sensors that we're working on. Uh, and that could activate immune responses against the cancer, which could be really effective then to eliminate cancer cells from the body. So these are two areas where I think our research is really relevant. Uh, and uh, of course, there's also uh, the main focus, which is understanding viral disease, as Miriam outlined. Yeah, um, and we've just actually had a question coming in. So yeah, keep them coming, because uh, we'll try and get as many answered as possible while we're live. Um, but someone's asked, you know, how many types of different cold viruses are there? Putting you on the spot there, if you... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's hard to answer. So yeah. for example, the, um, the symptoms you experience when having a cold, so fever, um, this sweating, um, all of that. A lot of that is a side effect of the interferon, the messenger that I mm. mentioned to warn the other cells. So these kind of symptoms you will have with a lot of different viruses, which are not necessarily a cold virus. Mm. And then of course you have the common cold, mm. which is caused mm. by a lot of viruses and um, you have flu viruses. So it's not that there's one cold virus, it's, it's a variety. And, uh, and what I find really intriguing while I'm in this environment, and I just want to say, like, you, I don't know if you can hear all the different sounds and things going off, <laughs> and the alarms and all those sort of things, but, you know, what is the most interesting thing that you do, you know, in your research here in the lab that you quite enjoy the most, probably? So I think working in a lab is a really fun and interesting kind of job. I think uh, the thing that really attracted me to it that I love the most is being able to be on the edge of new discoveries. Yeah. So you're working on questions which, uh, to which the answers are completely unknown, which is really exciting mm. uh, because you have the chance to really make a contribution to science, which I think is really fun uh, and also important. And Miriam? Um, I just love finding out stuff that you can't really see by eyes. So I think every technique we learn is, is interesting because we get to see the virus or the cellular factors from a different angle. So I love yeah, just seeing Im immune fluorescence pictures, but also analysis where you can quantify a more broad range of, of infected cells. It's, it's really interesting. And I think each, each piece of method we have adds a different angle. Yeah. And um, you know, if our audiences were uh, watching and kind of going, oh, I'd love to kind of get into that line of research or discover a bit more, you know, what kind of pathways did you both take to, to get to where you are now? So should we start with you, Leo? Yeah, sure. So um, I kind of, I've always been a bit obsessed with science. Like <laughs> as a kid, I was always reading like encyclopedias and things like this. But, um, and in school I had very good teachers and actually by chance, my biology teacher in high school actually had a PhD. And so that got me very into science and, uh, and I tried to get some experience to visit labs mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and then I got really hooked onto viruses <laughs> when uh, I was doing my undergraduate research project in a lab at UCL. I had a very inspiring virology lecturer and I just thought it was fascinating that something so simple as like Miriam really explained, it's, it's a small number of genes, is actually able to cause such complicated and devastating diseases um, which can have really huge implications on the world, uh, humanitarian, economic, everything. Uh, so that I found really interesting. Uh, and then I, I did some, some lab experience and I ended up here in Oxford doing my PhD. So I hope to continue to research viruses and learn more. Yeah. And what about you? What was the pathway to your... Uh, I think it's, it's a bit similar. So I got my first microscope when I was like 10 maybe. <laughs> um, and it was super exciting. I just put everything underneath that I could find uh, in our household. 
Um, and then uh, during my early school experiences, I've had the chance to do some research projects like youth competition thingies in science, which was a lot of fun to um, see how science would work. Um, I've done some internships before studying, um, and then I started studying molecular medicine, which is like just the interface of all natural yeah. sciences uh, and medicine, so we understand how a disease develops. And I got hooked by viruses <laughs> and uh, done my PhD in that area, and now I'm here as a postdoc. So. And you've just moved to Oxford, haven't I've you? I've just moved to Oxford, yes, so, in October. Yeah, so if anybody's uh, you know, watching from around the world, please let us know, because we'll give you a, a shout-out as well. Um, another question that's come in for one of you, I don't know who wants to answer it, but uh, what imaging techniques do you use? Ooh, I would love to answer this question okay. because, uh, as Miriam said, we train a lot in, in different methods in the lab. Uh, and I've recently, uh, recently been training to use what we call confocal microscopy. So that uses lasers and uh, fluorescent labels on proteins and cells to allow us to stain different parts of the cell and also often viruses so that we can see how they infect the cells, where they're going. Um, so I use that. Uh, and, of course, every day we use basic light microscopes, which probably people are, are more familiar with, uh, just to look at our cells, see that they're happy, uh, and then we can do more simple experiments, monitoring cells, for example, after a virus infection. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much for tuning in if you've uh, been watching this Facebook Live. Um, but please keep your questions and your comments coming in because um, they will answer them uh, as, as the time goes on. But thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.